Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Wow, this was quite something that we heard from Ben Carson. Quite something indeed. We're going to talk all about it. He just dropped this major hint, major hint on live TV. You know, nobody's talking about this. Nobody but me. Why do I find myself in this situation all the time? It is great to see you all. We have so much to get to. We got to talk Taylor Swift. I mean, my goodness, what is going on, right? The big kiss there at the NFL game. It's like the Taylor Swift Super Bowl. And, and Joe Biden's kind of hoping it can be like the Taylor Swift 2024 moment. We'll get into that because there's a political connection to all this, which I think is a lot of Americans like now. Seriously, really, do we have to see her again? This feels so contrived. We will discuss. And oh, wow, like Michelle Obama, we've talked about this, the threat of her running there for president and, and Obama getting this kind of quasi third term Who'd want to do this, right? Well, maybe they would. I just found some new sound. It's actually old sound, but I, I had not seen this before, and I got to play it for you because it's Barack Obama talking about whether or not he would ever consider a third term in some way, shape, or form. Welcome again. Great to have you here. I am Trish Regan. This is the Trish Regan Show. We are brought to you, as always, in part by our wonderful friends over at LegacyPMInvestments.com, 1-866-589-0560, 1-866-589-0560. All right, so breaking news here on Donald Trump's potential VP. You know, he's been dropping hints, he himself, that is, Donald Trump, here and there. I do believe he did this big town hall the other night with my old employer, Fox, and uh, Brent and Martha, they, they asked him a little bit about this, and he said, you know what? I know exactly who I'm going to pick. Watch. Who would be in the running for a vice president? Well, I can't tell you that, really. I mean, I know who it's going to be. Give us a hint. I'll give you. We'll do another show sometime. Well, what about any of the people who you've run against? Would you be open to mending fences with oh, any sure, of them? Oh, sure, I will. I will. I've already started like Christie better. <laughs> Chris Christie having just dropped out of the race, of course. So we just got a little bit of intel, a little bit of intel from none other than Dr. Ben Carson, because he was flat out asked, hey, has the president contacted you, sir, about being vice president? And, you know, this is what you got to love about Carson. He's so not like a politician in this way. It's actually, this would be a very interesting pairing, shall we say, because you know Donald Trump is not like a politician in any way. And then you got Ben Carson, who is not exactly, you know, hey, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me, right? Like, like a lot of typical politicians. So this would be a very interesting comment. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So Ben Carson, Dr. Carson, brilliant man, Strong conservative, has been very aligned with Trump all along. He was asked, hey, has the president, former president, talked to you about this at all? I want you to see his response, and we can talk about it. Here we go. This is also one of the reasons President Trump is doing so well in the polls. Has President Trump contacted you to be his VP? Uh I don't want to talk about what we've talked about, but we've we've talked about what can we do to save this country, and that we will work together to make sure that America remains America. There's yeah. so many things that are going on right now. You, you know, compromising the DOJ, using it to injure your opponents politically. These are things that occur in, in China and Russia and Cuba. Those are not things that are supposed to occur in this country. Yeah. And we should be alarmed, and I think the American people are alarmed. Do you see uh, more support from the black community for President Trump? Absolutely. Uh, I used to go to places and be the only black face. <laughs> not anymore, not by a long shot. And I think people are starting to recognize that the Trump administration uh, was on the side of black America. The thing. Wow. So very interesting, interesting thing that he said there. Like I said, you know what, Ben Carson, he's not going to like sit there and lie to your face. So he was in a little bit of a situation there. It's like you can say, you can't say. Just so that we can add on to this, you know, we can talk about Tucker, we can talk about Kerry, we're going to talk about Tim Scott and all these other people, Byron Donaldson. But listen to what Donald Trump also said 
when one of the Fox people followed up and said, hey, 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 you know, you told us that you already knew who you wanted for VP. So can you give us any more hints? And Trump kind of tried to shut him down a little bit. This is relevant. This is relevant when you think about the potential for Ben Carson getting the, the gig versus, say, I don't know, like a, a Tucker or a Carrie Lake or somebody who's going to be just, you know, Vivek, of course. I know a lot of you guys like him. I see that in some of your, in your comments. When you think about some of those bigger personalities versus, say, Ben Carson or even Tim Scott, and there are others, uh, the, the, the Gnome, right, the governor out there in the Dakotas. Let's take a look here at Donald Trump explaining what he kind of envisions there on the VP front. You said in our town hall that you had an idea or you might have already decided about your VP pick. When do you think you're going to make that? Well, it's never really had that much of an effect on an election, which is an amazing thing. Both election and primary, hey, it's never really had much me, of an effect. Right? I may or may not release something uh, over the next couple of months. There's no rush to that. It won't have any mm -hmm. impact at all. The person that I think I like is a very good person, a pretty standard. I think people won't be that surprised. But I would say there's probably a 25% chance it would be that person. Is Senator Tim Scott on the list now? No, he's a great guy. You know, he, he endorsed me. There's an example. Nikki comes from South Carolina. Tim Scott is from South Carolina. But if you look, the governor, great governor, another senator, Lindsey, we happen to like Lindsey. But uh, Henry McMaster knows her very well. He endorsed me. It's very hard for a governor to endorse somebody when you have, you know, I mean, Henry McMaster was the lieutenant governor under her and he endorsed me and he's going to be here tonight in 15 minutes. You're going to be watching him speak. Really interesting pivot there. If you look at Donald Trump, brilliantly done, actually. So Brett Barr is like, hey, 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 you know, what about the VP? And he's sort of like, yeah, it's really not that big a deal. And he's right. He's totally right. It is so not a big deal. Like the VP, it's just interesting ladies and gentlemen, because we kind of know who's going to be the top of the ticket anyway. I mean, unless, you know, we got a, a Democrat plant thing going on with Nikki that we don't even fully comprehend yet. I'm pretty sure it's going to be Donald Trump. He's already ruled out Ron DeSantis. He's ruled out Nikki Haley in terms of being on the ticket with him. And as he said, like, once you say those things and you rule them out, it's kind of hard to go back on that word. So Tim Scott, he had very nice things to say, to say about him. Ben Carson, we know he likes Ben Carson very, very much. Another person that they've talked about from time to time, that would be a, none other than the, the guy who used to have the show opposite me on the Fox News, right? I was on the Fox Business Network, eight o'clock every night. Tucker Carlson, who would be, in my estimation, a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating show. I don't think it's gonna happen. And I think that Tucker actually said it really well when he was asked about this by none other than Roseanne Barr. He went on her podcast and, you know, she lets it all out. She's like, hey, you know, what do you think? Like, is this, are you thinking about it? It's kind of cool, right? They're, they're possibly looking at you for VP. Here's Tucker's response. First of all, on the crazy train there, how do you feel about Trump saying he would consider you for vice oh, president? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I put that in the category of asteroids striking the earth, <laughs> good or bad. Uh, it's so far out the side, outside of my control that I, you know, would I'm, you, I'm flattered. Yeah, it is flattering, isn't it? For sure. But I mean, it's hard to, you know, I've never been in politics. I've never. Would you ever do it? Would I accept? Yeah. If I you really have to think you. about that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I spent my whole life looking at politicians and commenting on them and passing judgment on them. And I've never run for you know, room mother. And so the <laughs> idea of that is so far from anything I've ever done. It's kind of hard even to imagine. What do you think? I certainly support Trump. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And I can tell you, I mean, I've always agreed with Trump's policies always. And I lost friends over it. Um, but, and I've never really goes, actively right? supported anybody because it's not my job to actively support people. Right. I watch, you know, right. I like to watch, yeah. um, <laughs> but I'm a voyeur. Yeah, <laughs> but I became an active Trump supporter when they raided Mar-a-Lago last summer, the summer of 2022. That that that's just, that can't stand. No, that can't. And that I was something. agree with Trump on a lot, but even if I disagreed with Trump on a lot, I'd still be a Trump supporter because you cannot allow that. You cannot allow the, you know, the regime, the president of the United States, to use the Justice Department to knock the front runner out of the race. You can't do that. It sure feels like that, right? 
We're going to get to that in just a moment because I have details to bring you in terms of some of the lawfare, quote unquote, that's going on. But Tucker Carlson saying it really well there, ladies and gentlemen, kind of, you know, hey, I'm flattered, but it's not what I do. And, and I think he was being very truthful when he said that. Again, I think he'd be great. I think he'd be fantastic. I think he understands the media in enormous, vast ways, much like Donald Trump does. And I think he's got a head for policy. But I think it's very different, right? And again, I say this myself. You know, you're on one side of the aisle. To cross over and to be on that other side is a very surreal kind of thing. And, and I, I think, he, you know, he gets that. He gets it. So I don't think it's going to be Tucker. I, I hear that Melania Trump likes him, I'm sure, because he has a sophistication with the media. She wants to protect her husband. And I think he'd come in really handy. He'd help the country, I'm sure. But again, again, like think about this realistically. If you're Donald Trump and if you're Tucker Carlson, do you really want that? Tucker's got a great thing going. He just started his own show. He's going to be very, very successful. I have no doubt. And he's never been room mother. And then Donald Trump, let's face it, guys, like he's a big personality. The reason why up until, you know, they eventually had a very big falling apart. The reason why Mike Pence and Donald Trump worked so well together was one was willing to play that second fiddle. And you need that dynamic. You need that person who's like, okay, you're the quarterback and I'm your tight end. I'm sure that's bad for sport analogy because <laughs> my sport analogies are just in general really bad. Don't count on me for that. <laughs> I can tell you about Taylor Swift and why they think she's politically important, but I can't tell you much about the game. But you know my point. What I'm trying to say is, it's a lot to have these two big personalities. And so that brings me to another big personality that I know so many of you guys like. And you know what? I admire her. I admire her for her tenacity. I admire her for her willingness to really take on the establishment. I think I'm not entirely sure of the whole backstory surrounding these tapes. It's Carrie Lake that I'm talking about. Only in that, hey, you know, if somebody comes over to your house and doesn't think they're being recorded and you have a private conversation, that kind of stinks. It's suddenly like the guy's life is ruined and he's all over the news. All that said, she must have really felt strongly in order to have gotten to that point. Think of that. But I don't think it's winning her any friends and favors. I'm going to show you what happened to Carrie Lake in Arizona. But before I do, let's listen to a little bit of the tape. Because, wow, she certainly sounds like she's got a lot of chutzpah here. Here's Carrie Lake telling somebody to go, you know what? Is there a number at which... I can be bought. Can be bought? <laughs> That's what it's about. You can take a pause for a couple of years. No. And then go right back to what you're doing. Mm -mm. No. 10 million, 20 million, 30... No, no, no. A billion? No. This is not about money. This is about our country. I think it's disturbing that they would even, that anybody would think this is... I, I, no, to be fair, even me, even me, I'll say this. I want a fresh face right now for the reason that I've never seen anyone, I can't think of a single person in a federal race who lost, ran in and won. I can't think of it. If you can think of it, let me know. I am not going to let these people who hate our country tell me not to run. You should call them and tell them to get behind me. I, mean, I, I, I can win, and they should words. get behind me. I would, I will happily say those words. Yeah. Do you think my words will carry any weight? No. Okay. Well, did you think you would come in here and that I would be bought? So that was Kerry Lake talking to the former head of the GOP in Arizona, and he was allegedly some kind of mentor, according to him, to her. She at one point worked for his company, so she's like, you know what? Like. People aren't going to get me out. They're not going to pay me some amount of money, put me on some board and like keep me off in the corner. I'm here because I want to do good for our country. So, you know, we can take her at face word for that. She's actually, she spoke in a recent interview. We'll have to bring you some of those clips maybe tomorrow because it's pretty interesting. She actually was talking about how she felt threatened and she thought it was odd that he was coming to her house. And that's the reason why she recorded it. And then she sat on it for months and months and months and months. And now it's finally out there. And so there's a lot of people in the Arizona Republican Party that aren't taken too kindly to this. Hence, 
What I'm about to show you, a whole lot of booing for Carrie Lake. My goodness, they're in Arizona. This coming after she, of course, released those private tapes with the former head of the Republican Party. Listen, listen to this. We don't agree on everything, anything. but one thing we do agree on is the elections in Arizona are a corrupt mess. Can we agree that our elections are a mess in Arizona? You get no? it. Okay, yes, you there we go. It. And I know that more than anybody. Yeah, and President Trump it. knows that more than everybody. This Whoa. election is about making sure that our elections in 2024 are run fairly and there's not anybody in the country who's better at that than Gina Svoboda. That is why I endorse her and President so you wonder, as we talk about potential possible players in that spot for VP, how that affects Carrie Lake. Like on the one hand, it could help her a ton. The tape could get played. Americans could say, oh, well, she loves our country. On the other hand, like, look, I've known Donald Trump long enough to know that he may not like that. He may not like the idea that there was a secret tape and then it got leaked. I mean, he just may not be okay with that. I don't know. I have not spoken to him about it. But the other component that you got to consider with Carrie is exactly what I just mentioned with Tucker. Like, Carrie may be awesome, but maybe she should be top dog. Like, what are you doing running as the VP? The VP is a very, very different kind of position. It's like if, you know, you have a radio host, right? And you have this big, big like, personality. <laughs> radio and then you've got sort of somebody who's supporting it's just a different sort of thing right she's got to play the supporting cast member and the question is can she i think that she wants to be top dog and i think she could be i think she could have a big career in politics so why take the vp slot i mean think about it. who has ever gone on to do great stuff right as vp <laughs> and that was just easy. I was setting myself up because I'm thinking Joe Biden, he went on, he was vice president. I'm thinking like, who's out there? Dan Quayle and, you know, Bush only had one term. Do you think, is that going to be Biden one term? You know why? Because Biden was never presidential material because the vice president never is. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, this is just how politics works. You need somebody who's going to show up, who's going to go to every chicken dinner, who's going to sit there adoringly when the president is speaking and just bide their time. And I don't necessarily see, Vivek, I mean, I could be wrong. Vivek, you know, he's a big personality too, and he doesn't need it. He doesn't need the money he's spending. His, I love the guy. I think he's fantastic. And I think he's got a huge future, but maybe it's not the VP slot. Same with Carrie. Tucker, I think is going to have a huge career in media. So it would be sort of, you know, He'd be great, I'm sure, but like it might be kind of foolish to 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 do that. So there's there's different. I mean, Tim Scott, I think he'd be terrific. I think that Ben Carson is brilliant. He'd be awesome. You've got Governor Nome who's in the running. I, I would have said in the old days, Nikki Haley. But now that 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 ship kind of you know sailed away, shall we say, in more ways than one. We just heard Carrie complain about elections and she wants to make sure that everything is fair there in Arizona. Of course, that was part of her, don't forget, her whole shtick um, and what she was so frustrated about. Well, let, let's let's see uh, what's going on here in the latest because you've got like all these different things happening. You've got so many lawsuits going on. I mean, some of them are pretty nutty. I think that the one in, in New York City in terms of his business and having him pay all these outrageous fines, that might be one of the nuttiest. I mean, I say it with my own bias, having been a business reporter my entire career. And I'm like, okay, now you guys have really jumped the shark. But this, this one on, you know, uh, Gene Carroll that he was dragged back into court for, this was stunning. This was an $83 million verdict, ladies and gentlemen, $83 million verdict. And I'll tell you, the lawyer for Donald Trump, Alina Haba, she was pretty upset. She was very emotional. She was furious. You can just feel her anger, I think, like coming right through the screen. She has this pretty passionate appeal 
that she's basically making to the cameras after Trump was hit with that $83 million verdict. Don't forget, he walked out of the courtroom. He didn't walk. He stormed out of the courtroom. The judge, and he had been going at it, the judge, Judge Kaplan, went after Alina at one point and was like, basically, hey, you know, you keep this up. You're going to be behind bars. So watch her here. This is Alina Haba, his attorney, and she's just livid, absolutely livid. I want you to see it. There was no proof, and I couldn't prove that she didn't bring in the dress. There was no DNA. There was no expert. My experts were denied. Two of them, two of them were denied to come in. They didn't bring, let me bring up that Reed Hoffman funded Ms. Kaplan. And you know what we got in there? That my witness, who was her friend, who said that she is a drug addict and the drug addict is herself that friend i found out in there was paid for by miss kaplan's firm and that is disgusting that is a violation of everything i stand for and that is why i stand with trump and that is why so many americans are so proud that he is running again and so excited to run to the ballot box but don't get it twisted we are seeing a violation of our justice system ladies and gentlemen You are not allowed to be stripped of every defense that you have. You are not allowed to be told. All right, so you're getting an idea now about why Donald Trump. Stay with this because they kind of mock her, and it's annoying. (laughs) Attorney is perceived as effective as she is, which is not particularly effective. Uh, Laura Coates, um, if you could truth squat a little bit of this, uh, Alina Haba was saying that Donald Trump was, was not allowed to introduce uh, defenses. Uh, What is she talking about? She's talking about nonsense and she's trying to rewrite history. And I honestly would not be surprised if she herself is now vulnerable to uh, accusations. Here's the thing, guys. You know what? She made a very good point in that they're trying to, to use lawfare to stop him. I don't know the particulars of this case. I mean, I've just heard it the way you guys have, which, um, you know, look, it's a defamation case. And so I even wonder about the lawyer, like she might be risking something, right? Like now she's in trouble because is that defamation because she kept it going? I don't know. But the fact that he kept doubling down, that that was the issue. But the $83 million, that's kind of nuts. And I think that what's going to happen ultimately is that people are going to say, hey, you know what? They're going after him. They could go after me. And that has been a very, very effective strategy. And by the way, it's a real strategy. It's not hocus pocus. They shouldn't be snickering at it and thinking it's a joke because this is a real strategy. If you have someone who has just lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, you know, maybe some of them are just, again, I'm not going to judge them. I mean, the New York one is wild, but like, let's, let's put that aside for just a second. The fact that there are so many and that they've done this so many times. And every single time they come up empty handed. And by the way, they probably will hear too, $83 million. It's going to get appealed. And already there are new twists. For example, Alina and her team, they're alleging that Kaplan, who was Jean Carroll's lawyer, was actually a mentee of Judge Kaplan. By the way, no relation, two different Kaplans. But they're saying, wait a second, how is this fair? Because the judge in the case, he's known this woman forever. She was mentored by him, et cetera, when they worked at a firm long ago in the 1990s. However, in her defense, Roberta Kaplan's defense, her representative said, you know what? No, that's not true. That Judge Kaplan and Roberta Kaplan, they barely knew each other. They overlapped for less than two years in the early 1990s at a large law firm where she, he was a senior partner. She was a junior associate. She never worked for him. So she was not mentored by him, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what the team is digging into on the Trump side. We'll see, see what happens. But regardless, Jean Carroll is out there doing a victory lap. Of course, you know, this was quite a verdict, $83 million. Whether or not she eventually gets it, we'll see. But I want you to see her on CBS just this morning talking about how she wants to campaign against Trump because everything's political right now. And she can go after him. He can't. He can't defend himself because that's defamation. Remember, that's the $83 million suit. Watch. Said that when you've actually faced the man, 
He's just a man with no clothes on. Yeah. It's the people around him that are giving him the power. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, Hans Christian Andersen's great fairy tale, The Emperor Has No Clothes, that is written about Donald Trump. It's just we're the ones who clothe him in all this power. Hmm. He has none himself. It's his followers. It's his hangers on. In the court, they were strutting back and forth and handing him messages. It was, right, Robbie? Ms. Yeah. Curry. Ms. Curry, you say he's nothing. You say the emperor has no clothes. The emperor is trying to run for president yes. again. And, and right and, now is leading. And right now, the polls suggest uh, it's a <laughs> coin flip. It's very close. Um, have you heard from Joe Biden's campaign arm about potentially campaigning against the former president, Donald Trump? No. Are you interested in doing so? Do anything I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So um, they, they can sign her up along with Taylor Swift, it sounds like. <laughs> We're going to talk about Taylor Swift because they're looking at her. She'd be quite the surrogate. Can't you see the two of them there? Headline and headline and everything together. Look, no matter how much they keep throwing at him, he really does seem to be Teflon Trump, if you would. I want to share with you the latest and greatest, the new polls. You know, there, there's a site called Real Clear Politics. They've got real clear polling, and they, they basically look at the average every single day. So it's kind of a handy thing to kind of check. And he's still up. He's up big time. He's up 4.3% has that lead on Joe Biden in this hypothetical presidential election rematch. And he's, he's at basically, let's see, 47.3% versus Joe Biden's 43%. So the more they keep doing all this legal stuff, the more his numbers keep going up. And I'll be really interested to see whatever polls we get out after this $83 million thing. And, and, and this has just sort of been a momentum that he's been able to build upon. I think about a couple of weeks ago, he came up 10 points in the Reuters Ipsos polls. Just the other day, that one came out and he was up 10 points from where he was before. And then if you think about, we haven't seen these polls yet again, but where he was in November with all those swing states, the New York Times did a poll themselves in conjunction with Siena College. And what did they find? That he was way out ahead everywhere, except for I think Wisconsin was pretty tight, but way out ahead. And the reason is, the reason is the economy, right? It is the economy, stupid, along with the border, along with what's happening internationally, just really quick. I mean, horrible, horrible stuff. We, we can get into it in more depth tomorrow. I, I just, I feel so terrible for the families. Three Americans dead, 34, at least at last count, injured. Um, just, just horrible stuff. The Houthis, uh, you know, they, they've been firing these these bombs into our our air force bases overseas and and military bases. Forgive me, our military bases overseas. And this, apparently, according to one Wall Street Journal report, was greenlit by Iran. Look, we got a problem. We got a problem. Joe Biden himself did say his condolences to the family. It's not clear if he's going to go over there. It's not clear if he's going to meet with the families. I think there's a lot of open-ended questions. And you know me, I'm hesitant to jump on until I, I until they come up with their plan. But at least hear the president here speaking about those three dead Americans overseas. I think we have him, uh, maybe not. But anyway, the president did actually say how sorry he was and how, how sad this was that three individuals had lost their lives. There are a lot of confusing stories coming out right now, so I will just leave it at that. Look, it, it's sad because as much as we all talk about wanting, say, I don't know, green energy, green energy, green energy, there's the reality that we're still very dependent on the Middle East at this particular time. I wish it wasn't that way. You know what? I wish we had more American energy so that we could be dependent on ourselves. I mean, that's what we need, a real energy plan. And I'm all for the green stuff. Don't get me wrong. But I'm also a realist. And you can't just jump from zero to 60 like that. You got to fill the gap. And you don't want to fill the gap with nat gas from Russia and oil from the Middle East, thank you very much. Not if you can actually do this stuff yourself at home. I mean, how moronic to not actually think about what's going to happen between now and then as you make this big transition. I'll tell you, they haven't been thinking about this at all. 
never been thinking about this in any way. They are too political. They don't understand business. They don't understand economy. They don't understand, frankly, human nature. Secretary Granholm. Wow, this is fantastic. I got to show you because she was just humiliated. She was absolutely, positively, utterly humiliated on another network I used to work at, CNBC. She went on the morning show and Joe's awesome. I love Joe Kernan. He's probably the only conservative over there. And he basically kind of just let her have it because she tried to spew nonsense. And he's like, hello, you can't say that. You're absolutely wrong. Let's watch Secretary Granholm on CNBC. Take a peek. And that harkens back to, to President Biden's campaign vow to put the fossil fuel business out of business. And, and he said that, he said, read my lips. We will put fossil fuels out of business. Uh, I, I did not hear him say that. I think the oh, president I can, I, recognizes, just look at YouTube. as we all do, that there YouTube. is to be a managed transition, that fossil fuels are not going away in the immediate. <laughs> that is why it's the on focus YouTube, on lady. That the U.S. has been such a leader in making sure but that what's your, how long do you think, Madam Secretary, do you think, I mean, just give me an outside, do you think it's 50 years or do you think it's five years? Because if you're pausing now, it, it assumes that we're going to be able to transition in like five or 10 years. There are people that say it's going to be at least 50 years for the global economy to be able to operate. It can't operate without fossil fuels. Oh, you can't get Joe, fossil you fuels go. without Talking infrastructure. Common sense again. I am. It's early in the morning for her. <laughs> Didn't you like He's like, oh, it's on YouTube. Well, guess what? It's all over YouTube. We did a little search. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. It's everywhere, okay? But here's it in multiple di different variations. But here's, here's one of the best. It's Joe Biden telling a young woman not to fear because we're going to end fossil fuels. Exactly what the energy secretary thinks he never said. Uh, but, but kiddo, I want you to just take a look, okay? You don't have to agree, but I want you to look in my eyes. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we're going to end fossil fuel and I am not going to cooperate. <laughs> He just needs to call Jennifer kiddo. And then maybe she'll remember, right? My gosh. But you know, this is not the first time she's found herself in that weird position. This is another great one. She went on another financial network, another one I used to work for <laughs> on another morning show with another great host. And he's like, okay, you know, you just came in, you're energy secretary. What's the grand home plan to make energy prices lower? And she starts laughing like a hyena. Kid you not, must see television again, humiliated on live TV. Let's cue the tape. In Sturgis, Michigan, it is $2.89 a gallon. I guess that's better than in California. What is the grand home plan to increase oil production in America? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that is hilarious. Would that I had the magic wand on this. As you know, of course, uh, oil is a global market. It is controlled by a cartel. That cartel is called OPEC. And they made a decision yesterday that they were not going to increase beyond what they were already planning. Wow. She laughed when he asked her if she had a plan to bring down oil prices. Our energy secretary thinks that's funny. And then actually it's completely, utterly, totally controlled by OPEC? Well, yeah, if you let it be, lady. If you actually said, hey, we're going to drill here in the United States of America, then maybe, maybe you'd have a prayer of actually bringing oil prices lower like they were just a few years ago when it was drill, baby, drill here in USA. Again, nothing against green. I'm just the realist who doesn't want everyday Americans trapped, doesn't want our country falling behind because we're not taking care of business, so to speak. Obvious stuff. Really, really, yeah. I mean, look, and then you got the, uh, the crazies out there, these, these climate change people that, that f forgive me, no, this is, this is food, this is food. This is food security, food security. The, Trish, keep it straight. Other um, activists, that care about food. I guess it's related to the environment, isn't it? This is food safety. And they, they somehow thought that 
in order to get their message out, they'd go to the Louvre in Paris, France, where the Mona Lisa is, and they would try and deface the Mona Lisa. Let's watch this one. Mm. So that's soup. And they're speaking French. I speak a lot of languages, but not French. They're saying, however, that our farming system is sick. And that it's really sad, basically, when you're valuing art over food security. And I guess they're calling the police, but the biggest course of action is to just put up a bunch of screens because they don't want the people getting the attention, which clearly they're getting right now. But um, a couple of a couple of women there that want to really make it known that food is uh, very precious, so they threw tomato soup on the Mona Lisa. Isn't that food? I guess you didn't need that soup very much, did you? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what's going on? It's like liberalness all over the world. We're seeing uh, actually a new study that came out of the Financial Times specifically citing that this liberalness is a very, very big deal, especially among the 18 to 29 female population worldwide here in America too, which may be why it may be why all of a sudden there's this very keen interest from the Democrat Party in Taylor Swift. Let me show you the headline in today's New York Times. What does it say? Oh, we got it. We got to get going on the Taylor stuff, the Taylor stuff, the Taylor stuff, right? Inside Biden's anti-Trump battle plan and where Taylor Swift fits in. So, it goes on, right? Because he's got to get somebody excited. And she suddenly got people excited about football in ways that they never thought was possible. They've got ratings like they've never seen. The New York Times writes, the biggest and most influential endorsement target is Miss Swift, 34 years old, the pop sensation and NFL enthusiast. Yeah, I wonder about that. Who can move millions of supporters with an Instagram post or a mid-concert aside. She endorsed Mr. Biden in 2020 and last year. A single Instagram post of hers led to 35,000 new voter registrations. Fundraising appeals from Ms. Swift could be worth millions of dollars for Mr. Biden. Like everybody wants to bring their teenage daughter. I mean, apparently it's such a big deal that Gavin Newsom is in on it, right? Gavin Newsom of California allegedly begged Ms. Swift to become more involved in Mr. Biden's campaign when he spoke to reporters after a Republican primary debate in September. So that's who they're trying to woo, because clearly, I mean, if she can conquer football, she can conquer the country. Here's Taylor Swift with Travis Kelsey, big old smooch on camera. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to continue watching her when we see football. An mm -hmm. awesome job. No turnovers by Kansas City. They got 66 yards in total offense until that play against Mar Marquez Valdez Scantling as you, Travis Kelsey. Hey, with, with Taylor Swift. To the victors go everything. I don't know. Hey, 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 good. It is. But I'll say this Kansas City coaches did a great job. <laughs> and That's not, my question to you guys. Do you buy it? Is this real romance? I said before, like, She's 34 years old. She really doesn't need to go to all these football games. I'm sure it's not like, you know, she wants to be at all these football games. I mean, really, right? Like, they're, they're both full-grown adults. He skipped some awards party in, out in Hollywood. Were they not uh, doing enough backroom deals? I, I don't mean to be cynical, but I did happen to see this the other day. I've showed you before. Like, nobody's talking about this, but did you notice the very strategically placed Bud Light cans at the Buffalo Bills games? Yeah, so they went to this cutaway shot and it was shared over and over and over and over again. Hey, Drew, can we play this if he's got it? Yeah, this is great. So look at the two Bud Light cans coming in right there. That's Travis Kelsey's brother. And that was like shared over and over again, of course, because like he's shirtless the whole bit, like they're hugging. And the security guy, I assume he's security because he's got sunglasses on at night. That's kind of weird, right? As soon as he sees that camera come on, what does he do? He takes his Bud Light right up into the shot. It's like me with live free or die. You know what? We have a Trish Regan shop. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I actually do need water. And it is my coffee mug here, but water's in it. He's definitely doing that because he knows the camera's there. So I, I hope they're getting some kind of big payday from Bud Light. One would have to assume, again, not to be a cynic, but this is kind of how the world works. My old colleague, Geraldo, he's apparently not a cynic. He's just a romantic. Let me share with you what he said on Twitter. He said, don't be jaded. 
Fairy tales can come true. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey represent the best of America. See, he's trying to help build them up. Build them up for Joe Biden. They seem genuinely to care for each other. They're enormously talented, excellent at what they do. I don't disagree with that. Plus, Travis and brother Jason are the pride of Cleveland. Okay. Wow. All right. So now you just ride that one all the way to the bank, Joe Biden. Because if you can't campaign for yourself, maybe, maybe, Travis and... uh, didn't he do those Pfizer commercials for a heck of a lot of money? So you could get Travis and you could get Taylor to do it for you. And you know what? That actually might be a strategy. I'll share with you this. A a new study reveals young women, young women, that could be his base, you see. I mean, he likes them. He likes the young ladies, right? They are overwhelmingly liberal, like super duper liberal. I mean, I was stunned by this. Absolutely, positively, utterly shockingly stunned what is going on ladies i would say ladies and gentlemen but no ladies what's going on a new analysis in financial times reveals here that young women between the ages of 18 and 29 are far more liberal than their male counterparts also 18 to 29 the gender gap among the young has never been wider what the heck it also shows a 40 percentage point gap a gigantic gap. I mean, 40 percentage points, for goodness sakes. 18 to 29-year-old women are more likely to describe themselves as liberal than men of the same age. In other words, 65% of young men, they're out there saying they're conservative, and only 25% of young women will say they are conservative. Now I understand my demos. I get it. I get it. I get it. Because I'm always like, why don't we have more women watching us? seriously this is like this is like all of my social media channels it's like you know it's actually probably more like 70 percent men and 30 percent women but that's 65 25 that's massive and what else is incredible is that this is global right this is not just the usa which biden's gonna make a play for all those young ladies we're gonna get them out to the polls it's global And I was just wondering, like, why that might be. Why might that be? And I think I have the answer, ladies and gentlemen. I think I have the answer. And it may have, oh, I'm just, this is a wild guess. Wild guess. Judy, we have that that chart on education. I want you to see, unfortunately, young women are so much more likely to be in debt. We've got one more chart I want to show you. It also, the the worst of the bunch is the... The trans group, actually, which actually is really, really $6,000 more in debt than even the women. But the average student debt for women in the U.S. is, okay, I'm showing my age here because my, my eyesight's going. I'm trying to lean in. It's like 31000 and change. And it says that women have this debt at a staggeringly higher rate than men which is pretty amazing. Think about that, guys. So women are overwhelmingly in debt. 66% of all student debt belongs to women. So you've got to ask, is there a correlation between that and what you're seeing with this new study that young women are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, not defining as conservative, forgive me, overwhelmingly liberal. And, you know, since Taylor's a liberal, I get it now. I get it. There's a method to the madness. And that's why you see her everywhere, because some people have picked up on this idea, ka that not only is she good for clicks and business and ratings, and, and I'm not going to, like, take away anything from her music, and she wrote a lot of those songs originally herself. Great. But there's something more there that a lot of people can capitalize off of. And uh, that's probably where they're heading with this. Hey, it's great to have you all here. I want to thank you for joining the program today. I want to remind you to subscribe. Thank you. I do see your live comments. Leslie, you did make it. You made it. Thank you for being here. We're going to keep this conversation going because I have a lot more that we did not even have a chance to get to today. And I do want to talk to you. Send in some of your questions and stuff, maybe in the in the comments below, because we can continue the conversation when we have a little bit more, more time tomorrow. There's a lot going on here. I'm all over it. Thank you for being here. I'll see you tomorrow.